Welcome to the second clip that belongs to the sixth chapter, which is about the power of workers. And in this clip, I will talk about critical perspectives on employee voice. And I will also dive into the associated lit literature on industrial relations. As you may remember, the critical perspective views the power relationship between employers and employees as problematic. By definition, the employer is the more powerful relationship and employees have all kinds of risks if they speak up and voice their concerns, for example, about their employment conditions. So this is the starting point of the critical perspective, a problematic power relationship between employers and employees. After this clip, you will understand three different perspectives on this critical perspective. So first I will dive into what is actually meant by the critical perspective, what are its origins. I will go into the concept of the conflict paradigm. Then I will show two applications of this conflict paradigm, first in labor process theory and second in industrial relations theory. And of course, you will, I will show you some practical relevance for policy making as well as human resource management. Remember that we started off that uh, employees voicing their concerns is actually the preferred reaction. Preferred reaction because if employees speak up about what concerns them in the employment relationship, they will feel better, so it's good for their well-being. But there's also benefits for the organization because it gives the organization to, the opportunity to act upon concerns of employees. The vehicle for voicing concerns is dialogue. A dialogue can resolve dissatisfaction and reduce exit behavior of employees, which in the end is undesired behavior, both for employers and for employees. However, there's a risk for employees to speak up because in the power relationship, employers may perceive employees who speak up as disloyal. And disloyal employees are a concern and you rather get rid of people who are um, complaining. So out of fear for losing their jobs, employees may stay silent. However, silence we know have ne has negative effects. It affects the performance and the well-being of employees. So uh, here today we will zoom into the critical perspective. So starting from this unequal power balance. So what are still opportunities or channels for employees to speak up and voice their concerns in a safe way such that employees benefit from it as well. So what's the origin of critical theories? And you can maybe already draw from the picture and from the words there that uh, the godfather of critical theory is Karl Marx. Uh, in his book on Das Kapital in the early 20th century, he described a situation where the gap between uh, those who own the production means and those who add value by working for these uh, facilities was actually becoming larger and larger. And more and more people would end up in poverty and more, uh, fewer and fewer people would own all the means and become very, very rich. And he f saw this as a source for conflict. I'll explicate in a little bit more detail on the next slide and then explain how this relates to uh, modern perspective on, perspectives on human resource management and industrial relations. So what's the uh, conflict theory in a nutshell? Um, like I said, uh, there's a small class in society called by Marx as the bourgeois who controls all the production means. And there is a large group of people in society called the proletariat who provide labor and who add value to the products. So a product by itself doesn't do anything. It can't act. Do. You need labor to add value to products and to increase the value of those products. So raw products are uh, worth a little bit, but if you transform them by manual labor or by any type of labor into something that has more market value, then there is a lot of added value from the rough product to, the, uh, to what is in the market. However, th those who add value to those products by 
offering their labor, they only get a small reward for the value added. A lot of the value added is going into the pockets of the capitalists, of the bourgeois. They are largely rewarded through all these sales and profits. So there is a problem when this when this uh, added value that, is, that goes back to workers is really, really small, because in the end, you will have a poor working class who looks up to the bourgeois, who has all the, all the means, um, and leaves a lot of people with have nothing. Uh, according to Karl Marx, the consequence is that this uh, proletariat, the people who don't have anything, will be very dissatisfied, and eventually they will revolt against the, uh, the owning class. So you're probably familiar with this line of thoughts. You're also familiar with how it affected in, uh, for example, the Soviet Union. There's a lot of criticism. But this, this rationale that there is uh, an unequal... Uh, there's groups of society who have more, who have more power, who have more means, and groups of society that are less powerful and also have less resources. This is the essence of, of conflict theory uh, that informs also the thinking about human resource management. So conflict theory has become a, a, a common and dominant paradigm in sociology. Um, it builds on Marxist thinking about this unequal division of benefits across society. And according to the conflict paradigm, any social system, so also a country, society, is not defined by consensus, so people don't agree about this division of resources, but by conflict. So there is uh, social inequality. There are social groups, some have power and some have not. Some can change their situation and others cannot. So this is common thinking in sociology. We also see that this uh, conflict theory paradigm is is, uh, has been applied to employment relations because there are two groups, two social groups, there are employers and employees, and there is, it's visible, there is different power in employers and in employees. I'm going to talk a little bit about the two key theories in this area, so labor process theory and industrial relations. The focus of both theories is they try to understand the rules that management uses to uh, manage employees and to what extent it is an expression of exploitation. So remember the thinking of Karl Marx? So in the, the powerful groups, they are striving to keep the costs of production as low as possible, so a small amount of returns that are... Uh, coming in through added value, go back to the ones that actually created the added value, so employees. The concern of all the critical theories in human resource management is the fairness for employees. So to what extent is the rewards that is there for employees in a fair balance with what employees have added to the organization? So let's have a look at labor process theory. This is almost uh, it's very much concentrated on this power question and also how human resource management is not so much a vehicle to make employees happy, but a vehicle to exploit uh, workers, to make them work as hard as possible for as little as rewards uh, possible. So, Labor process theory oftentimes uses qualitative research methods. So they go to an organization and they try to understand by watching in the language that uh, is used by management if there's actually a fair exchange of rewards to workers or is there some hidden agenda behind what, is, behind what they're saying. As an example, let's turn to the title of chapter two, which is called Investing in People. Well, this sounds really nice, investing in people, doesn't it? However, what do organizations actually want when they invest in people? So what's behind this nice idea that investing in people is a good thing? Well, actually, what they intend to say, but not with so many words, if they invest in people, we expect that employees will do more and that they work harder. 
and that they have a larger contribution to the returns eventually uh, to the added value of a product. And we're not going to pay so much for them because they have all these nice trainings. Why? Why should we pay more? So investing in people according to a labor, labor process theory analysis would be something that is a di disguised way of labor exploitation. It's, uh, Karen Legg has phrased this uh, as uh, a wolf in sheep's clothes. Em human resource management acts nice, but in the end it's a management vehicle that is just there to make employees work harder. Interesting perspective. Okay, so to wrap up, labor process theory is a theory that uses Marxist conflict theory to understand what human resource management is actually doing to workers. So is it there to restore the balance and make sure that employees have a fair reward or is it actually a vehicle used by management to make employees work harder? Another perspective that uses the conflict theory paradigm is industrial relations, and I'll turn to that in the next slide. Industrial relations, that's the entire set of uh, stakeholders that have a say in the rewards that employees receive uh, for the efforts that they do in organizations. Again here, the starting point is employee voice. It's a preferred reaction for Employees. So if employees are in the opportunity to say what they would like, what their expectations about uh, uh, salaries and benefits are, then they can start a dialogue with the employer and they can come to terms of agreement that are beneficial for everybody. So employees willing to, uh, to work longer and uh, employers to, uh, to have the employees that they need for the, for the work. So... Because employers and employees have different interests, employers having an interest in productivity, employees having an interest in fairness, uh, and employers being the powerful relationship, the fairness of employees is at risk. So there is always a risk of exploitation when it comes to employment relations. Industrial relations come in, comes in when workers use their power collectively so one employee complaining may be a risky business for this person. However, if all of the employees of an organization decide that they disagree with what the employer is offering, offering then all of a sudden they can exert quite a lot of power. So for example, by organizing a strike, if nobody goes to work during a strike, then the organization can never reach its goals. So united workers can exert quite a lot of power. A vehicle to, uh, to unite and to exert power is to organize in employee unions or trade unions. These are official institutions where employees uh, are a member of and who on behalf of employees negotiate with organizations. So what unions offer to uh, the potential exploitative nature of the employment relationship is that they communicate on behalf of employees. So a single employee is not vulnerable anymore because they are represented by a trade union who negotiates on their behalf with the uh, employer to secure that they have good benefits. This dynamics, so employees teaming up together in unions, the reactions of employers, and also the role of the state, so regulations in there, we know this as the domain of industrial relations. So industrial relations is the literature describing the power and influence of labor unions and organized labor representations to promote the fairness of employment relations. Industrial relations theory reasons that, that, that this is a good thing. Employees <clears throat> teaming up, organizing in, in trade unions, in, in labor unions, are a benefit to organizations, to employees, but also to society at large. 
Let's have a look at what Schumpeter says and how he disagrees with Marx about how conflict actually helps societies ahead. So Schumpeter starts with a shared point with Karl Marx. Uh, he states that if we leave the, uh, the labor relations, the employment relations to the free market, it will do no good. It doesn't apply to labor markets because there are frictions and there's this power relationship. So in the end, it's impossible that there is a wage equilibrium and there is a risk that employees are the party that suffers and will be exploited. However, Schumpeter disagrees with Marx about the consequences of this mix in power. Whereas Marx claims that eventually the powerless will rise up and overthrow the owning um, groups in society, Schumpeter states that this will not happen because before we end there, there is a group of people in society who will speak on behalf of the subordinated, of the exploited workers. And they will, they will engage in politics. And politics will be the buffer that will um, against conflict in society. So Schumpeter sees the system of industrial relations, so again, employees teaming up, joining representation unions, as a political mechanism to balance the, uh, between the needs of workers and the requirements of organizations. So according to Schumpeter, industrial relations will protect, protect against social unrest. Before it comes to a revolution, there will have been politics, and politics will have uh, secured that, uh, that the terms and conditions of employment for the weakest people in society are not that bad. Um, and because politics are there, there will be quietness and stability in a nation, and therefore, with the absence of, uh, of a big conflict between employers and employees, there will be stability in a nation. The companies can flourish, employees can just do their thing, and there will be welfare. So Schumpeter is a little bit more of an optimist than Marx, you could conclude. Actually, this uh, industrial relations theory as proposed by Schumpeter is very much reality. So if you look into practice, you'll see that there are a, a lot of representation units, unions, uh, representation bodies, in society that safeguards that the employment relations in organizations eventually are fair. So this a schematic overview of all the parties involved in establishing the terms and conditions of employment of people in the organization. So what do you see here in this, in this figure? The triangle represents an organization. And in the organization you see the arrows going down uh, for management to employees. So this is the managerial prerogative. But they also go up because there are channels in the organization that uh, facilitate a dialogue with management. So even within organizations, there is dialogue, and I'll come back to that later. For now, I will zoom in the, the higher level external to the organization bodies that have an impact on what happens in organizations. So what you see here, the yellow colored um, um, stakeholders in industrial relations, these are government, these are employers associations, and these are the trade unions. Uh, and we know this as the tripartite negotiation. These parties on a high level, on a national level, they negotiate together, each country in its, in its own tradition, but in essence, they negotiate about what should be the kind of labor laws, what should be the regulations that all companies, all employees should adhere to. These inform the rules of play within the organization. And these inform the rules of play the level below. So there where it comes on uh, the negotiations between employers and employee representation about the terms and conditions that are used in an organization. There are many different flavors here. I will keep it brief. So important is to remember that there are different parties external to the organization that together shape the field of industrial relations. They determine labor law, but also uh, sectoral agreements, for example, a collective agreement. 
these influence the uh, the leeway that management has to exert power over employees. And within organizations, you see a, a replication of this stakeholder um, um, dialogue. So if also within organizations, uh, sometimes trade unions are active. Um, they can directly negotiate with management or they help employees who are elected in employee representation bodies in the organization, such as the Joint Consultative Committee, to negotiate with management. So the picture of industrial relations shows a kind of institutionalized context in which no organization can decide completely by itself what the terms and conditions of employment are. There is this whole body of stakeholders who watches over what is happening and who takes uh, the interests of both the employers, but definitely also the fairness of employees into account because this ensures national societal stability, which is an important uh, good for, um, for countries. Moving on. So what are the benefits for employees um, and the economy at large, if we look at the system of, I call it European industrial relations, but it's also pretty common in many other countries. Um, so this idea that there are national consultation boards or tripartite councils is pretty common. Um, and always the trade unions, as well as employers associations, as a government have a role in that. So there are country differences in how they communicate and how willing they are to listen to each other. But nevertheless, this tripartite interaction exists. Um, and these together, they, saw, they, they make sure that there is a social pact. Um, so there's governance support. Uh, for example, if economic adjust, adjustment is needed, uh, but also to ensure that there's fairness and social cohesion. There are loads of examples in the literature. A known example is, for example, in the 1970s, when uh, the European countries were suffering from uh, rising Asian countries, um, and there was a need to uh, reduce on wages to make sure that the economic growth uh, could continue. And by the, uh, by the support of trade unions, an entire country was able to, to take this economic priority over uh, employee fairness. In contrast, there are also great examples for where employees have, uh, have had a, uh, a good say in this uh, uh, industrial relations. For example, think about pension systems uh, and also uh, quite recently the, uh, the wage compensations that uh, were organized during the, during the pandemic. So, so in, uh, to conclude, uh, industrial relations, they are uh, important, they are uh, a means for employees to voice concerns in a safe way, and they are institutionalized. So they also uh, contribute to the social foundation of, of, uh, of modern countries. There's also literature claiming that uh, allowing employee voice in organizations through formalized, organized work, so allowing literally trade union employees in the organization has benefits for organizations as well. This literature is particularly originated in the United States where employers tend to be really, really, really careful to allowing um, um, union activities in their companies. So see, if you have to contrast Western Europe with the United States and the United States is a, a fonder believer of the free market economy, whereas Europe is more geared towards uh, the Schumpeterian way of doing and um, keeping everybody on board, on board through the system of industrial relations. So imagine an American organization. Uh, some organizations do allow union activities and others don't. So what Freeman showed in the 1980s is that companies who allow trade union employees in the organization, they showed better results. Why? Because uh, having a trade union employee in the organization provides a direct channel for employees to voice their concerns. So there's more dialogue. Uh, and this dialogue 
uh, make sure that there is fair conditions and then employees will generally just feel more motivated. So what, as a consequence, Freeman could show that uh, the benefits for employers are that there are that there is lower turnover levels, um, that there are uh, more possibilities to act upon dissatisfaction among employees, and also they used the union work as, a, as, a, as an area to test human resource management policies. Would it be a good idea to implement such and so, or would it be a good idea, or would it be a bad idea, how might employees react? So actually the dialogue, not only afterwards, but even before uh, policies are interested, uh, has benefits. So this uh, this brings me to the back to the triangle of the uh, of the organisation within organisations. Industrial relations happens as well. Trade unions can be active in organisations, um, and in some organisations, it's not even the trade unions, but there is really a system where uh, employee voice is organised. For example, in a uh, in a works council. So all these things, they lead to uh, opportunities for employees to engage in uh, voicing their opinions about the organization, about the policy, so basically about uh, anything. A short distinction about single channel and dual, ch dual channel um, uh, organization of industrial relations in the workplace. A single channel means that all the communication with employees goes through uh, union rep representatives. Um, so in case of conflicts, union representatives provide a safe channel for employees to complain to management. Whereas in dual channel, the joint consult committee, commission, um, Organizations have a works council and they are an advisory board that exists sometimes with, but oftentimes also without union employees. So it's an employee body and they cooperate with management and they act in a more together way, in a unitarist way to make sure that the organization functions well, but also that em employees benefit. Um, so this is more a harmony model, whereas the single channel is more a conflict model. So what's the task of human resource management in industrial relations? You may wonder where does the HR department step in? What does the HR manager do? Well, the task of human resource management is to reduce exit behavior, so to keep as many employees as you need on board, and to facilitate employee voice in organizations. So for example, the task of human resource management department could be to develop a grievance procedure where employees have a safe channel where they, for example, can complain about, uh, about unwanted behavior by support superiors or whatever. So a safe channel to speak up when they feel disadvantaged. Also, they can uh, advise about um, yeah, how uh, about organizational politics and what is important to make sure that employees stay happy and that there is no conflict or revolution happening within the organization. Important to remember is that human resource management actually is a representative of management. So in the power relation with employees, the human resource management department is actually not a friend of the employees, but it's the friend of management. It's in the uh, and this shows very clearly when it comes to collective bargaining. So where trade unions negotiate with employers about the terms and conditions of employment, it's the human resource management representative who represents the employer. HRM does not represent workers. Trade unions represent workers. HRM does not. After uh, the negotiations, it is important that all these agreements are implemented in the organization, and that again is a role of the human resource management department. So they have to make sure that the company adheres to labor law and to the collective agreements that might exist for their company. So to conclude, industrial relations provide a safe channel for employees to voice concerns about fair employment conditions. This entire literature is based in conflict theory. And industrial relations are a means to stabilize conflicts between employers and employees in an organization and in society. So now you know inequalities in power between 
employer and employees mean conflict. Starting point is conflict theory. Um, this can be in a hidden or disguised way in language, which is the central point of labor process theory. Uh, conflict can be managed through industrial relations and that institutionalized uh, employee voice. Schumpeter is a big thinker there. Industrial relations happen on national, industry, and organizational level, so it definitely is about the context of organizations. And finally, uh, in organizations, uh, union representation is an effective way to protect and promote the voice of individual employees and to reduce exit, as Freeman has shown to us. Thank you.